uh, apart from her um, technical achievements uh, going back throughout her uh, civil service career of 38 years in the Department of the Navy um, and her leadership at multiple levels in the organization, um, the other thing that's notable to me is her continued uh, sideline work to encourage and mentor and advance uh, the civil service and, and the engineering workforce in particular. So uh, very grateful for that additional duty uh, that she takes so seriously in helping uh, the continued development of the, of the engineering workforce in particular. She's going to lead a conversation with a panel to represent some of the perspectives that, we, that Ben uh, raised of some of the audiences that we want to try to convince that S&T is valuable. And so I um, look forward to this conversation. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, as a technologist myself, um, I often get mesmerized by the, uh, by the beauty of the science and technology that has been developed by our, our workforce. They do fabulous things and bring fabulous things to the forefront. But it's often a disappointment uh, when others are not equally amazed and enthusiastic about the wonderful things that, that we've done. Uh, so to get the discussion started today, uh, as Marin pointed out, we've put together a distinguished panel of folks to hopefully have a conversation with you and they represent communities that we don't traditionally think of as scientists and, and technologists when it comes to understanding how to move our product uh, through the transition. That I've heard some call it the valley of death. I prefer to call it the valley of life. Um, but move through that transition into engineering development. Um, they each have um, a role in that world and have influence that can dramatically um, shape how a particular science or technology opportunity is perceived and indeed how successful its transition is. Um, it's wonderful to see such a broad spectrum of uh, participants here today. Hopefully um, you all will ask us some tough questions as we, as we um, have this conversation with you. First I'd like to um, turn it over to uh, Dr. Hicks. strategy and policy. She has had tremendous influence in shaping the Department of Defense thinking um, over the last uh, five, six years, particularly as she led the uh, 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review. She currently, um, as you can see in her bio, she currently serves as the Henry Kissinger Chair here at CSIS. So Kathleen, if you could uh, share with us sure. some of the perspectives you've gained over the years. Sure, thanks very much to Mary and, and to Maren for pulling this great group of people together. I, I feel slightly awkward being already you know, uh, identified as a non-technologist among technologists, so um, I hope when Mary said you have hard questions, obviously the hard questions should go to Mary and the, the easy policy ones you can send to me. Um, let me first explain a little bit about how S&T um, was an issue set that I dealt with. Uh, as Mary said, I'm, I was one of the people in the, during my time in the Pentagon, and, and, um, uh, and I finished up there in, in uh, G, I think it was July of 2013, responsible for aligning strategy and program in, in, in a broad sense, but also in very specific ways. So S&T was clearly an area that I looked at in terms of developing what are the priorities for S&T, working with um, AT&L and others. Um, what are the right S&T funding levels for the Department of Defense overall, even with, the, with those priorities in mind of specific areas. And then in specific issue areas, I was very invested in terms of what is the S&T pipeline look like. So for instance, counter A2AD capabilities or something of that sort that's very important to the strategy. Um, cyber capabilities, what, what is in the pipeline, what are we developing, how does it provide a comparative advantage to the United States. So how was information best communicated to me? Probably, um, probably ideal for someone who communicated it to me to tell you that, but in my mind at least, what always worked for me was that when information was framed in terms of what the technology possibilities were in terms of provision to the decision maker or the war fighter. So that could come across in terms of decision time gained, information, ability to give information, um, a, the potential for de-escalation, 
um, the, the survivability advantages. In other words, all the attributes the decision maker is trying to think through as they develop the long-term strategy and then think about how to operate day to day, those were the things that the S&T community could, if they could uh, translate the technology into what the potential was for delivery, that could make a tremendous um, difference. Personally, I'm a person who learns best through words. I'm a leader. Um, other decision makers are often visual, so I think it's always important to understand how to, com literally, how to communicate the information. Is it oral? Is it, again, a picture orientation? Understanding how the decision maker consumes that information, particularly when there's such a bridge in a case like this between a technology community and a policy community. Just being able to have the information flow in a way that's well received, I think, can make a big difference. And let me just leave off with one final point. There's really, I think, an ever-present hunger for new solutions. So you have a receptive audience in the policy community. The, the problem there is, is the warning that that provides, which it's really incumbent on the technology community to help um, be very clear about the problems that can exist between the concept or the idea of the technology and going through the valley of life um, to get it into delivery. What is the timeline like? What are the technical challenges? What are the um, industry challenges that might be associated with that? What are the budget and political challenges? The more information you can provide to set those expectations fairly at the beginning will help you keep that program alive uh, when patience wears thin later on. Thank you. Sure. Uh, next, we have Dan Adams. He is the Minority Counsel for the Senate Armed Services Committee. And his portfolio includes science and technology, where I've had the pleasure of numerous interactions with him. He's a great supporter of ours. Um, Dan, I'd like to ask you to share with us some of your experiences that you've had. Absolutely. Um, just a little background. I also come from not having a technical background. Um, I lose half of you when I say I'm a lawyer. Um, it never goes over too well because then people are afraid to talk in front of me. But the reason that uh, the reason that we have this thing today, and I appreciate CSIS uh, putting this on, definitely appreciate uh, you know, Ms. Lacey uh, being able to moderate this. Uh, it's very important to be able to very clearly communicate technology. Uh, now, what I look for when uh, I say communicate the technology are two things. Um, that is because I work for the Senate Armed Services Committee and I make my recommendations to the members of that committee. Uh, the two things that I look for are one, can you actually very clearly put, uh, put the science, put the technology, put the research into everyday English? Uh, a lot of people that I work for, work for are very smart. They do not have technical backgrounds. Um, they don't speak in the same language of megajoules and kilowatts and ribonucleic acid and some of the different things that put on the medical research every single day. Uh, but if you're able to put it into the capability and everything that Kathleen just said is a very good place to start, then, then that is a very, very good thing that for us to be able to handle. Um, the second part is how it does relate to national security. Um, we need to be able to justify having the Department of Defense spend money on the research. Uh, main reason for that is we've got kind of a confined budget situation right now. So there's always going to be this, um, this competition between you know, current readiness and modernization. The research is going for the modernization. If you're not able to explain this modernization part, it's very, very easy to cut it. Uh, people definitely understand, I, I need an extra tank for the soldier. I need some barracks to put these people in. I need new surveillance to go down to Southcom and be able to help out in the, you know, the drug trade that keeps coming up here. Um, on the other side, kind of the in-the-weeds science part is a lot more difficult to explain. Uh, inherently, we know science is very important. We know research is very important. Um, but if you're not able to explain that little part, then, then we're not going to be able to make our decisions very well, and more of that money is going to be going to the readiness. Um, the reason that this is very important, uh, you've heard Secretary Kendall, Frank Kendall, talk about it quite a bit. Secretary Hagel has talked about it, about the technological superiority enjoyed by the United States for decades uh, is eroding a little bit. Uh, we've still got a lot of the best scientists. Uh, I would still put my money on you know, the Navy and the services over, over many people. However, um, uh, the United States is not actually driving the conversation in a lot of the technological and a lot of the science fields these days. Uh, part of that is some of the conference issues. Um, part of that is budget cuts. Part of it is because it's very difficult to communicate what's going on. Uh, so those are the two big things that I look for. One, just put it into everyday English so that smart people at the correct decision-making levels can make their can make their decisions, and two, actually connect that to national security. Um, because just as good government, we can't just be pumping money into something 
uh, there is a good thing there, but if we can't explain it, then, then I can't justify actually having to keep it in a budget. Thank you. And Paul um, joins us from the fourth estate, so fourth estate to fourth estate. Um, Paul is the Pentagon reporter for Defense News, and his beat focuses on policy, doctrine, politics, and those sorts of things. So you have conversations with technologists all the time. I'm sure you find that very enlightening. Yeah, I mean, I think the challenge in my job is that I need to try to bridge the gap on some level between the technological community and the more general purpose audience. Most of our audience is DOD, the Hill, think tank. So I mean, there is a certain knowledge there to, to, be, to start with. Um, but there's a challenge in taking, as you said, uh, the new offset strategy, whatever it's going to be, and trying to describe that, what that is. Um, it hasn't really been defined by the DOD so well yet, just that others are catching up to the United States, state actors, non-state actors, so what does the United States need to do in order to try to leap ahead to the next generation of technology that they did in the 70s and 80s and things like that. Um, and where I come in, you know, speaking to the tech technical community to try to, they're not always, engineers and scientists aren't always the best at explaining what they do. They kind of come in and say, well, here is this capability we have, it does this, 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 and they use very, tech, you know, very complicated language and they kind of don't understand when you don't understand it. So to try to take that, put it in more layman's terms, you know, and add a policy element to it, is really kind of the, 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 the challenge of, of, of what we're doing. Um, a few years ago, it was a very different landscape. I mean, you had the rapid equipping force, you had uh, joint equipping initiatives, you had lots of gear being developed and going to Iraq and Afghanistan. So there was a lot happening. Um, it's pretty well defined. People knew what the capability gaps were. Um, and everyone was working together to meet them. Now it's much less defined, I think. Um, the threats are so diffuse. There's, you know, ISIL using small drones that they bought, you know, online on Amazon.com. You know, do you need to defend against that? How do you defend against that? What are the capability gaps there? What do you need to develop? What's the policy issue, et cetera, so. Thank you. I know you and I talked last week. One of the things that, that I have, as a technologist, that I've always been curious about is what causes a story to go from a story to an op-ed piece? And that is something that we technologists often are very concerned about, that, uh, that there's going to be some public um, judgment about our technology um, in a way, as, as, a, as example, but as something going from a story to an op-ed piece. Well, I mean, those are two very different things, right? I mean, I, uh, if I tried writing an op-ed piece, I think it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't really see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, that depends. I mean, you know, op-ed pieces are written, obviously, by policymakers and, and, and folks on the Hill. Um, and the story, it's just generally conveying some information. I mean, you do some digging, you know, and, and you, by speaking to policymakers, you, f you find the capability gaps, you, you, and then you go to industry or, or whoever and try to, uh, you know, ascertain what's out there to fill these gaps. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's a long process, but uh, I mean, yeah, an op-ed piece would be uh, much different than, 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 than what we do, so. Thank you. So we have um, some microphones, I believe, that are available for folks who I'm sure there are some questions. Gentlemen over here. Hi, J.D. McCray from Georgia Tech Research Institute. So it sounds like we have a, a panel here that's mostly focused on policy and public communication about technology. So how do we communicate parts and pieces of the problem? Like you said, we understand how to sell a tank. We may not necessarily understand how to sell a component of that tank because we haven't figured out that it's the key component. And so if we look at one particular topic, you mentioned drones, there's a lot of research that's being funded outside of DOD, right? R&D in the commercial world eclipses the entire DOD budget. So if we look at autonomy, as an example, and you look at the Google driverless car, how do, we, how do we ensure that we're advancing disruptive technology, disruptive innovation, without necessarily knowing where the final product is gonna be? And how, how do we start influencing policy at the national level to include things like autonomy uh, in when we start thinking about m machines making decisions for us? 
if I could jump on that first. Um, so you picked my favorite buzzword, autonomy. Um, part, part of the issue with some of these big research areas uh, are that we don't have a defined uh, meaning behind some of these terms. You mentioned the word autonomy. Now, I've sat through countless briefs this year from the Air Force, from the Navy, from industry, and every single time they use the word autonomous or autonomy, I make them stop and I say, explain to me what you mean. You will get a different, different definition almost every single time. Um, so basically, we all kind of have this innate uh, you know, feeling that autonomy means sort of an intelligence-based capability or decision-making capability where an operator does not have to make the decision for the machine right then. If it's a ship that has sense and avoid, it means it goes out and you don't have to tell it to turn right. It just sees that there's something in front of it and it starts going around there. Um, so that's the easy definition of autonomy. Most of the industry guys actually have that. Um, not everybody in government will. Uh, so they get frustrated when I say, what do you mean by autonomy? And they'll say, well, autonomous. Now the reason that this is a concern for me is that we've got it as a focus area. Um, it's in the Reliance 21. It's one of those interest groups. So somebody will come up to me and give me a brief and say, you need to fund this because it's autonomous and it's this great thing. And I will say, what do you mean by autonomy? They'll say, well, what do you mean? What do I mean? It's this important focus area that I've got. You need to just fund me. So it makes me a little more skeptical. Um, so I mean, my advice on that, just to be have, uh, and this isn't as much your fault, it's just kind of a community issue. But when you come in and say autonomy, and, and you're saying machines making the decisions and kind of go down from there, give just the one step below of what do you actually mean. Um, and from there, you're talking about kind of the components of the tank, that sort of thing. Uh, at least for me, start big picture and say, look, here's a tank. We understand the, um, you know, the relevance and the value of having this thing here. However, if I put this extra part in here, then it's going to be able to go this much farther. It's going to protect the soldier this much better. It's going to have a gun that's going to be able to you know, kill this many more people or hopefully not have to because it's deterring that many people. Um, so hopefully that answers the question a little bit, but number one is we, we need to have kind of a defined meaning behind, behind some of these big, uh, big issues. I would just add, I think um, also st it's helpful to have the technology community be part of the course to step back and help policymakers understand the changing nature of defense technology and that it is so much commercialized and internationalized so much more than previously, and that many of the innovations will be emerging on the commercial sector that may have defense applications. So just helping folks understand that some things may be emerging through the DOD s and pipeline, sure, and then there are a lot of other applications that are, as you say, sort of less than platform, whether they be sensors, again, on the information side, cyber, and other areas, and certainly in the area of autonom autonomous systems where um, increasingly you're going to see the innovation occurring on the commercial side, and it's really about how does that feed into the U.S. defense acquisition system, and how do we marry operational concepts that are militarily relevant with those technologies that are coming from outside. I think there's an issue, too, is if um, the commercial industry wants to come to DOD, um, and DOD has to come to the commercial side because um, I mean, just the margins are less. I mean, DOD will probably buy less. They'll have lots of hoops to jump through. We have a lot of red tape. Um, so if guys like Richard Branson or Joe Bezos or some of these small sat makers or robot makers want to come to DOD and do this, I mean, a few years ago, the Army, but they still have it, the network integration evaluation down at Fort Bliss, where they, they build it as they're going to have, they build it as all these small, they want all these small industries and, and, and companies to come to them with their innovative solutions for technologies, for mostly communications. Um, it didn't really work out like that because the small companies couldn't afford to send, you know, five robots and 10 technical experts down to Fort Bliss for three weeks, you know, in order to take part in this. Whereas Lockheed Martin Raytheon could do it, but the, you know, small mom and pop place couldn't really afford it, so they ended up mostly uh, dropping out. The Army tried to institute some programs to, to help, help fund them, but um, there's a big gap there between what the DOD wants and what the commercial industry can or, or wants to bring to them. Secretary Kendall has recognized that that is a structural problem within the Department of Defense in capitalizing on the um, commercially available technology. So as part of Better Buying Power 3.0, he is honing the attention of the senior acquisition um, force to deal with that um, issue. We are missing um, because we have many commercial players that either don't want to deal with the DOD 
or we haven't figured out how to have that conversation with them in a way that we can capitalize on the technology and the investments that they've made. So, great question. Thank you very much. Who's got the mic? I can't see who has the mic. Do we have some folks? Okay. So, um, my, my name is Scott Badnock, and I have a small business in um, the Detroit area, but um, I also ran a skunk works within General Motors for a number of years and introduced electronic stability control. And as I, as I move from, uh, one of my roles is to advise uh, private equity, venture capitalists, investment bankers about how to uh, evaluate the, the ideas that come before them. And if they were having the discussion, they would be talking exclusively about the people. And what we talk about is the process, the idea, and I really, it's my question for the lawyer here. Um, how much is our evaluation driven by the legal pro process of acquisition and that it has to be fair and open competition and therefore we've sanitized uh, the people. There, there's, there's no Edisons, there's no Nashes, there's no Einsteins, it's the idea. Can you, can you speak to how our legal process addresses that? Uh, I mean, at least from a bill perspective, um, once we get into the acquisition, there's, I mean, a lot of that is actually regulation driven. Uh, as far as the other part, I mean, just from a theory part, we like to have the extra competition. Um, generally speaking, you're going to get a better product. So it's kind of weird. Back <laughs> from that end of it, we're going to have a it's just an econ-based thing. That's just sort of how it goes, and that's the reasoning behind why we like to have the extra competition as more people are going to go into it. Um, I know that means there's going to be a little bit more red tape sometimes because people have to reach certain milestones as far as the people part. I took over the science and technology portfolio at the beginning of the year. I um, thought it was very interesting that over half my time is actually based off of infrastructure and based off of hiring practices in order to try and be able to have smart scientists be able to come in and actually do some work for us. Um, from the other part of that, and as I I didn't uh, articulate as well earlier. Somebody's trying to explain to me the value of a certain idea or the value of a certain program. Um, the process isn't the part I'm as concerned about. Um, I, I want the big part. <coughs> Those are the details that we get into a little bit later. From the beginning of it, uh, as I said, I don't want to know the component of the tank, the science part of it. I want to know how it's going to protect the guy inside the tank first. So if you come to me with that first, then I'll say, okay, let's start getting into the process and how we're actually going to get there in the best way. Um, I mean, from the actual acquisition part, I'm not an acquisition guy, so I couldn't get you into the uh, specifics of it. Am I getting so sorted to the question, or it's am I going off tangent? No, no Edison, no light bulb. And I would bet on Edison rather than the process. And along the way, I, I think Edison would probably come up with five or six different things because he is fiercely determined and would rather die than fail. And that's what I think is missing in our, our discussion. Uh, we've got to find those people and get okay. them working on I agree we need good people. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know I if don't that's know the... Doing, I'm not, I think it's a gap. Somehow or other we're not... Okay. It's a gap that we need to address. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Cynthia Cook. I direct the Acquisition and Technology Policy Program at the Rand Corporation. We've met before. Um, I hear a couple of threads. Um, when we heard Mr. Riley this morning, he was talking about the difficulties of pushing technology, you know, prototyping and other sorts of um, strategies to, to, to get this done. And from this panel, I hear things like, how the technologists communicate better with you, how they get involved in, the, in your processes to help you understand uh, what they have. So it is a very sort of consumer orientation, which is appropriate to the, this panel. The question, though, is what can policymakers do to give stronger or more focused signals to the technologists so that they can push the better technologies? What are the, do you have any case studies or insights into uh, um, successful uh, cases where you've provided a signal that people have been able to meet? 
I'll, I'll answer that. Um, first of all, I think there's a huge onus on the policymaker. I'm going to go a little beyond what you asked because that's something I wanted to talk about, but, it, but it, as you said, it was not exactly the, the topic of the, of the panel. Um, policymakers have to educate themselves on asking the right questions, um, having uh, an ability to be an educated consumer is often how I'll talk to people about it. We can't become technologists if we're not technologists. I mean, maybe there's some people who love to get popular mechanics or something, but you know, that other than sort of a, a cocktail party version of being a technologist, we really do have to accept that we're not the experts, but that we have to be educated consumers. So I think there's a lot that policymakers can do. And again, it comes down to sometimes to experience of what are the right questions to ask, what has not been put forward that you need to pull. Okay, to your question about um, how do you, how can a policymaker help the S&T community, uh, it's clearly through guidance and prioritization. So, uh, for instance, we do things like try to put out the S&T priorities, um, and, and that's something that's worked across DOD. Now, granted, that back to the issue of commercialization, that tends to happen in a relatively closed environment process that doesn't involve, doesn't take account of the seismic shifts happening uh, underneath what will be the S&T base for DOD. So there, are, there can be ways to improve that process. And in general, the extent to which we are reaching out and understanding what's happening beyond the edges of DOD and defense industry proper. Um, the next thing I think is to, as we run through our decision-making processes, for, for, for lack of a better phrase of it, um, and we're looking at solution areas, you know, whether it's a rail gun or it's, um, you know, an, an um, air, unmanned aerial system solution for ISR, whatever the way we're going in the capability area and then the solution, the capability, the solution link is, um, I think it's very important for the policymakers to lay out through that process what they're looking for. That gets back to the kind of the list I gave as examples before. Are we looking for survivability? What's most important to the decision maker? Is it having time and space for the National Command Authority to be able to make decisions? Okay, what provides that time and space? And this will vary depending on what kind of technology you're talking about. Is it to um, be able to um, create greater gradations in the escalation potential, and how do you do that? Is it to find non-kinetic solutions to the problem set? How do you do that? So it is a dialogue. It can't be sort of a, you know, a, a five-pound document that gets dropped that has all the answers. It inevitably is a back and forth where both sides are learning from the other because the information the technology community can provide, the policy community can shift how the policy community thinks about what it needs and vice versa. So it has to just be a process that's fostered and is continual. Uh, my name is Patrick Garvey. I'm a senior associate here at CSIS. Thanks for the panel. To, to kind of pile onto that, what, Kath, maybe from your, from your background, where do you, how do you think we're doing at that? At, at providing that sort of that demand signal or whatever that says, you know, driving the driving the solution. How are we doing? How's the building doing at that? Um, our previous panelists said, you know, really described several situations where it sounds like it's 99 opponents to every one uh, proponent of of change, particularly in the technology area. Thanks. I think we do well at a macro level in terms of looking at broad areas of investment and seeing how they align to the strategic priorities, the strategies, the priorities. So, you know, when you're going through the process of developing the budget, you know, uh, at the end game of the program and the budget, there really is a scrub to say, okay, we say these are our priorities in very broad capability areas. Is that, do our investments follow that? So I think we do okay at that. I think when you go down into those capability areas, though, that's where the policy community starts to lose its um, visibility and fluency with how to, that's where we really start to rely on, in many cases, the services and our program managers, the S&T community, to be telling us how to position investments within those capability areas. Very high profile things, um, MDAP, obviously, those will float up, but again, much of what we're talking about, particularly in the future, are not MDAP-like things, and that's where our processes, all across from the budgeting side to the acquisition side, 
um, are not well suited to um, a highly commercialized, rapid turn, especially in the IT field, set of capabilities that DOD needs to leverage. Thank you. The, um, I would like to just explore that a little bit more uh, along with the comment that a lot of the Hill's focus was how to uh, meet the S&T workforce requirements, uh, workforce flexibilities, hiring policies, and so on and so forth. Ha if, what is your perspective or reaction to developing cadres within the Defense Department that is specifically well trained to look at commercial developments and farm them more efficiently and effectively, given that the Defense Department will never have the S&T bucks necessary to do all that? Yeah, so, so in the science and technology world, we actually are in a better position to do that than we are as you mature into the acquisition cycle. Uh, because we are a little less constrained by, by some of the acquisition regulations that come to the table. So we have a, a rich sharing of ideas that happens at the scientist and technology level. Um, so that conversation happens. Uh, I wish some of the restrictions we've had over the past couple of years in the conferences didn't inhibit it so much, but uh, it, it still happens. Believe me, when you get two scientists together, you cannot keep them from talking and sharing technical ideas, information, and opportunities. Um, some of the workforce flexibilities that have been introduced in the last few years are helpful but are not so compelling that we see a robust movement between the private sector, um, particularly in the IT world, and the government sector. I wish we had more. I wish we had a few more incentives that were appropriate for, um, for that workforce. But we seem to get these authorities that allow us to do things, but they're not very enticing to the people that we want to attract to take advantage of them. Um, so we're, we're struggling. We are struggling with that. Um, but from a people point of view, it, it can be done, um, and, and we can get that conversation going between the commercial sector science and technologists and the government scientists and technologists. But then we, need, we run into that barrier of the, of the acquisition, the introduction of the acquisition regulations, which are, are not as friendly to that uh, conversation. I, mean, I think there's an issue there in the requirements process, too. I mean, if you look at things like future combat systems or the, the EFV or the Comanche or you know, the Army trying to buy a new scout helicopter since the 80s, um, you know, DOD knows what technologies are out there and they know what they want, but then the problem becomes gold plating, I think, in a lot of ways, right? I mean, you have to, you know, there's certain weight requirements and protection requirements. And you can't fit all these technologies onto these platforms when they try to do it, then they get cost overruns and, and, and schedule slippages and the program becomes too heavy or becomes too expensive and, and, and they kind of, they, they end up falling off. Um, I think it's, um, a matter of quantity. I mean, DoD wants to buy a lot, and then if you develop these very expensive platforms, they can't buy as many, and then if they scale back, they will buy less, then each, each unit becomes more expensive, and then the program runs into trouble, as we, we've seen time and again. So um, I think the, the, there is recognition of the commercial technologies out there, but just bringing them into the government system and, and getting them on the platforms is, is a pretty big task. Paul makes an excellent point on the um, the introduction of exquisite technology and requirements that, uh, that over the years we have fallen victim to in the Department of Defense. I can only speak for the Department of Navy, but uh, in the last couple of years, we have emphasized additional rigor in the front end of the requirements process. So we understand the technical cost trade space in, in a far more robust way than we did, uh, for example, in the uh, 80s and 90s. So we are making progress there, I'm pleased to say, in the Department of the Navy. It doesn't mean it's as much as I would like, but at least we are informing our requirements with more fact-based uh, information so that they can, they can set the bar where it needs to be. Uh, as we often know, that last 2% of capability is often 80% of the cost uh, driver, and we don't need to be in that space. 
all the time. Mm. There are occasions when we do. Yeah. We've been over on this side of the room. Perhaps we could. Uh, Catherine Vanegopal, and I'm at the City Department. And so I wanted to take this maybe up a level in terms of R&D policy messaging. And you know, there's different types of research that have different purposes, basic research versus translational versus like a more development side of thing. What has the DOD done successfully to message that to Congress or to the public? And how can our other science agencies maybe learn from that and adopt some of those practices? Because DOD has a huge research budget. Some of our research budget has gone down, um, half a billion dollars this year. Uh, I think there's some other research agencies within the government that, I mean, almost triple the entire DOD research budget. Some of the things that have been successful, uh, just somewhere in the past, innately, people realize there's good research that's done at colleges, so basic research, a lot of it's done at universities, people just think about these abstract things there. Somehow, that caught on. People say it's basic research, it's something that will have an application someday. I will always ask, why did you start the research? And that will be why we need to continue funding it. Even if it doesn't have an application now, there's a reason you started it. Um, the person that's able to tell me, this is the reason I started this research, uh, they've got a much better shot than the person saying, I want to be able to do this interesting thing. I say, why do you want to do this interesting thing? Well, because it's interesting, and maybe it'll have an application someday. That's not a very good answer. Um, there is the answer of, from a mission-driven agency like DOD, say, so we've got a need for something Let's back it up a little bit, and maybe this will work it out. Um, now, from there, uh, there definitely needs to be the conversation of the fact that it, it will take a while. Um, we were just discussing a Navy, pro or a Navy project that's going on right now. It's a firefighting robot. Now, they took me over to NRL, and they showed me this thing, and they said, this is a few years away. And there were even some growing pains right in front of me where it kind of broke down in the middle of it, but then they got to show me what it was doing, and it was discriminating where a certain fire was in order to be able to do it and be able to integrate it with a firefighting team. I've now seen that. I now can actually conceptualize what this thing is going to do. Um, I know that it's going to take a few years. Uh, so that part of the conversation needs to be had a little bit more, because honestly, if I go out to an industry person, um, they're going to say, look, concept of fielding. I took this, you know, I was able to make this thing in six months. Now, the 20 years of research that happened before that, for the basic research, the applied research, and anything like that, that they were able to leverage in order to get the six months of it, um, that part of the story is never going to be told, ever. It's it's not as good for a bottom line. <laughs> um, however, uh, that is an important part because there was 20 years of research beforehand and we need to be able to leverage that. Um, so, the, so I guess back to the original question. Uh, the first thing that could tell me, this is the reason I started this research because although it might not get there, uh, because that's, those are the growing pains of the research process, process uh, at the end of the day, this is going to be able to help a sailor. Um, those are the people that are able to, to make, it, make it successful. Thank you all for being here. I would like to ask a little bit of the doctor and the member of the Senate Arms, uh, Armed Services Committee uh, whether or not it might be helpful if the policy personnel and also the staff members of the Senate Armed Services Committee might not have a little bit of, um, how shall we say, exposure to technology and also a little exposure to really what goes on at the bottom level of the armed services. And I'll give you an example. Um, I've been a private in the Army, and I know exactly what privates do. Uh, later on, I was a little higher than that, but uh, I, I, is, is, is that, do you all know of anyone for instance, the gentleman at the, uh, at the Senate Ar Armed Services Committee that, that has any background of that nature? Of having been in the military or well, having? Uh, yeah, having been in the military and also been, uh, let's say, an engineer. About, uh, no, go ahead. Um, I mean, about half our staff on a minority side is retired military. Some of them are former military. Yeah. Um, the, the, now basically, I, what you're telling me is that the uh, only member of the Armed Services Committee that has that kind of background is Jack Reed. I will say the institutional knowledge is there. Pardon? I will say the institutional knowledge is there. Um, I mean, I know Senator Inhofe was in, was in the Army for a couple years as well. Senator Reed obviously was, is a West Point grad. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, outstanding. Um, I mean, I will say, at least from the staff level, some of the things that we definitely try to do from the SMT part, I try and get out to you know the labs. I will try and meet with people. Um, so like I said, the demos are, I mean, are priceless. So we're actually able to conceptualize something. What we try to do when we go to installations as well, um, at least what our staff does every single time, is at least as part of the day that we're going to be there, we say, give me some of the junior grade officers and give me some of the enlisted guys, and we kick leadership out of the room so that they can speak to us very openly. And on the policy side, uh, for sure. the doctor, yeah. um, what, what, is the, what is the bottom line, what is the most important uh, thing that we need to do uh, policy-wise on, 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 the, on the individual level, the, the common soldier? I'm sorry, I don't think I understand. What do you mean it's the most important thing in a common soldier? Well, I would think what, the most What's the skill set that they need? Or what is the... I don't know what your question is. I I'm think sorry. the most important thing is... Oh, it wasn't a question. Go ahead. What, what is the I think the most thing? important thing is for them, for us to develop weapons that make their lives uh, less susceptible to the enemy. And uh, I don't see that being done. Um, although there is something that will do that. And in other words, urban warfare, uh, has, has the policy people ever addressed urban warfare and how that uh, affects the uh, soldiers? So yeah, there's a lot packed in there. Let me back, back way up to the question of the workforce. Um, yes, it's very important to have a workforce that understands through its own experience and other acquired knowledge what it is the warfighter needs um, and how technology, among many other things, the budget process, et cetera, how the system of the Department of Defense needs to function. So having that diversity of experiences in the workforce is very important. Like the comment from Dan, we have in the policy community in DOD quite a lot of retired military, but we also have, I would just say, prior service military, people who have done a few years of service and come out and uh, are, are now um, career civil servants. And I myself was a career civil servant for a long period of time. Um, so break, break. Your next question, I think, is about how do we think about, do we, I think if I were to interpret your question, do we have the empathy and knowledge to understand how the individual warfighter is looking at what they need? And the answer to that is hopefully yes. Um, and I, I mentioned, I ticked off some issues before. I think certainly survivability, and I think Dan also hit on this, the idea that, you know, what is that additional increment of cost or technology going to gain you in terms of protecting the individual soldier, is, or sailor or airman marine, is always critical to the decision maker at the highest policy levels. They're always looking for ways to, um, you know, take down um, risk. And the most um, evident example of that in recent years is, is Bob Gates and his push on MRAPs. So that is a perfect example of where the system really wasn't responsive, and it did take an individual, in this case the Secretary of Defense, to put his own pressure on the system, and even then he had to go outside the existing system to make it happen. So there are lots of barriers, there are a lot of weaknesses, and certainly people at every echelon are, are imperfect. Um, but there are cases where uh, decision makers at the highest level do take very much that into account as they, uh, as they look to how to invest their dollars for technology. Thank you. Look at over here. Thank you. I'm Paul Cadario from the University of Toronto. I'm with the Monk School of Global Affairs and the Center for Global Engineering. So I find this a fascinating subject. I want to go back to the comment that all three of the panelists made about um, focusing on the national security impact of the cool stuff that comes. And I think I shared Dr. Hicks' uh, skepticism over decision by PowerPoint particularly on areas as complicated as national security. So I would be interested in, and, and there is a long history of, shall we say, foreign, foreign uh, national defense issues being a little exaggerated, you know, going back to the missile gap, the war in Vietnam, 
WMDs, et cetera. So the PowerPoint might sort of exaggerate why a particular thing was in the national security interest. I'd be interested in all the panelists' comment on the extent to which there is a sophisticated presentation of national security interests on particular things that allows a decision maker, and I'll say the Congress, to make a trade-off between an MRAP and a better way of building hospitals in Liberia, and then ultimately a better way of building hospitals in Liberia versus mm -hmm. building improving infrastructure in rural areas of the United States. So is, is this, in that ecology of a decision making about a weapon system or defense acquisition, sophisticated enough to get all those trade-offs in there somewhere? And if it is, who's responsible for bringing that sophistication to the decision makers at each point? Uh, I guess if I understand it correctly, are you saying, is there a way to put all of that into a presentation? Or are you saying, what is the best way to present that to the... Both of those both are fine, okay. but uh, you know, it's a matter of you know, how genuine are the pearls and how real are the swine. Okay. So I guess, uh, generally speaking, how the process of how it goes, President's budget comes over, um, the congressional staff, uh, and the members will look at it. We'll get it from the very broad, you know, program by program, um, you know, breakdown of the actual budget. Uh, we'll go back. We'll kind of say, could this money be used here? Could this money be better utilized over here? So there's kind of your trade-offs. Um, so we'll, we try and get it down and give our best recommendations to the members. Uh, I mean, at that point, we have been asked many times. Um, you know, I mean, if the president comes out with a particular announcement. He says, I want to use, you know, $2 billion over here. Um, I mean, I've had the senators ask me many times, what else can you use $2 billion for? And then you'll end up hearing it in their talking points somewhere, somewhere later. Uh, the best way in order to do that, I would agree, PowerPoint is not ever the best way to actually put these things together. PowerPoint is definitely fine for a large presentation if we got this here. Most of the briefs I get, they're in a PowerPoint. I'm sitting across the table from somebody, and I'm having to flip through, and, and this is how we do it. Um, now, the way that I will give the information to the actual senators and the way that most of us will give the information to the senators is to write it in sentences. Um, we might have a graph showing actual, or a chart showing actual, uh, you know, numbers, but for the most part, we're writing it down into the bullet point saying, here, here's the bottom line, this is what this money is going for, this is what this money is going for. Here are the possible trade-offs because we could be putting this money elsewhere. Um, more going into readiness or more going into ISR assets, something like that. Uh, it, I mean, with a close to $600 billion budget, yes, it's very difficult to actually get it down to, to the nitty gritty. Um, but I would say the best way of doing that is just bottom line statements. Here they are. The human eye can pick up a lot on a piece of paper. Um, and if we don't have to flip through 60 slides in order to get what, honestly, you could get on one piece of paper, that, that's excellent. And that's the best presentation you can give. I would just add on your point about um, sort of a sophisticated, what you might call a sophisticated approach. I think, I think the reality is that the national security system relies so much on professional judgment, it just does, that um, there isn't an algorithm, there isn't a decision-making tool that we have come to rely upon to fundamentally enable, if you will, the dialogue that happens throughout the system. I, I think that's where maybe we differ a bit from industry. I'm not saying that's okay or that's good, but it's true, so you put in, there's, you substitute mass, there's a lot of uh, work hours spent um, in groups at ever higher echelons trying to figure out, you know, did we make the right decisions, are these the right trade-offs? All the way up through the, pres through the interaction between DOD and OMB to present the budget, and then the same thing, my guess is, with, with less mass, <laughs> happens um, on the hillside. So, um, it, it's, it's, I would say there's a lot of emphasis put on um, prioritization and how well are you making trade-offs between one area and another, but I don't think it would be fair to say it's sophisticated. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, the defense, the money that goes to the defense budget, I, mean, I guess to get back to your to point of kind of, I guess, public works projects versus defense, I mean, that money just doesn't get eaten by the Defense Department. It goes back to factories and workers in the United States who pay taxes and buy goods and services. So um, there are trade-offs, but I mean, those that that money stays essentially in house, I guess, right? Um, Steve Merrill with the uh, Duke Center for Innovation Policy. Um, 
I was intrigued by Mr. Riley's suggestion that one of the most important future areas for uh, s and um, to defense is uh, human performance enhancement. And I'm wondering if you could comment on what you see as the responsibilities of policymakers, the Hill, and um, the press in dealing with and addressing an area that is um, further out, probably more speculative in its utility and application, and, but especially that is further removed from, quite far removed from the existing capabilities of the s and workforce, both in the, in the Defense Department and in uh, the contractor community. Uh, then from, the, from the Hill perspective, what we generally try to do is just, I mean, give the authority to be able to do something that's going to help the warfighter. Men and women in uniform, uh, team of performance enhancement, and I mean, I know at least a number of the labs are trying to do that, so at least, at least from the legislative side, it's to give the authority, but allow enough flexibility that the smart people uh, working there are, are able to do their research. Um, and then, of course, we'll continue the conversation and say what kind of funding needs to go in here. But for the most part, I would say just offer enough flexibility that, that they're able to do their, do their job. From my point of view, and I apologize, I was not able to hear Ben. Um, it is an area where there's a tremendous amount of research that I believe is necessary for us to fully understand the implications of human performance augmentation. Um, things like feeding the troops butter uh, really does make a difference in terms of their ability to perform over extended period of times in stressful situations and things like that. Fortunately, the um, policy in the United States is currently fairly well defined in terms of the limits from the science and technology point of view of what we can do in, in the research arena as well as the experimentation arena. And uh, so we are informed by the current regulation and policy as we explore the options of uh, the human performance equation. So I'm sure as time goes on, um, we will be bumping up against the envelope of the, uh, the, currently, the, the current policy as instantiated as well as the um, intersection of science. Steve Ryan, Northrop Grumman Corporation. So um, at these forums, we talk a lot about the disconnect between the commercial and the, S and the small S&T world. And so I'm going to ask a leading question that relates to working for one of the major defense contractors, because no one ever does that at these forums. So my question is, what role do you see for the major prime contractors in facilitating both the conversation about changing science and technology priorities, as well as the actual acquisition and movement of these items into the defense acquisition chain? And do you see that changing over time? Uh, let, me, let me take that on. I, a, a, a prime role, I hope you like the pun, I think they take on a prime role. Um, we, are, we are facing in the midst of, you pick how you want to define um, where we are in the process of our shift in downsizing. Um, and the primes are affected hugely by that. Um, the areas of innovation that are most important to the strategy, that doesn't mean all the areas that are most important to the strategy, but the areas of innovation that are most important to the strategy, many of them lie outside the prime's um, uh, areas of, of, of specialty. So I think it's important for the primes to be thinking about, okay, as we downsize, this is gonna look different than it did in the 90s or the 70s because again, we're very commercialized, we're very internationalized, the value chain, the supply chain is internationalized. Um, so the, the proposition on how to survive that and thrive in it is going to be different. And part of it is how to get those small innovators into the system and if the primes don't like the way it's going to happen, they will crush them, and then we won't have innovation. So it's very important to have a dialogue from DOD with industry to include, very importantly, the primes, um, the top five in particular, to uh, make sure we're thinking through where we want to be on our defense industrial base. 
um, you know, five, ten years down the road. Because if we don't start having those conversations now, and I don't think we are having them enough now, um, those decisions are just going to be made, and we're going to end up with the system we end up with. And you know, in, uh, on the positive side, you know, the commercial sector is out there, but you know, I think we'll lose a lot of advantage over those five to ten years. And there's some areas where the commercial sector is not going to be able to substitute for a strong thread of defense innovation. It's defense specific innovation. I think we have time for one more question, and uh, I'm giving you a high five sign here. So. Gentleman over here in the in the back. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, what can be done to get companies through this valley of life in terms of getting together people to do the funding of it and uh, getting consensus on what are the criteria and their weights and maybe bringing the internet in. I think that's a million dollar question, honestly. <laughs> We've been trying to tinker with different ways to either more rapidly field something and get better te transfer technology or just try and cut some of the red tape so that the acquisition community is able to just pull from what's going on there. I mean, that, uh, that's a continuing conversation. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer for it right now. It is a continuing conversation, um, Dan, and it, it is one where we are continuing. Folks seem to be searching for the solution. There is not a single solution. The transition path an opportunity for a science and technology um, investment is different by sector, by, um, by the maturity of the development and, and the operational need. So as was mentioned earlier in, in our discussion today, the people um, are the ones that seem to be the um, part of the equation that is critical. Technologies, generally, in my experience, um, over the last 35, 40 years, don't transition. People transition technology. And um, if we shift our thinking to the, um, the people carrying forward the idea and bringing it through that valley of life, we tend to be much more successful. So, excellent question. Thank you very much. I appreciate the panel um, here this morning. I think we had an interesting conversation, which will set the stage for um, the activities that you all are going to engage in later in the day. So, thank you. service departments for uh, research and technology issues you must be named Mary um, <laughs> but you could draw that inference from uh, the, the lineup today Mary Miller uh, also is a career civil servant and uh, and one of the technical people in our mix of technical and non-technical folks today uh, electro optics uh, is her specialty as an electrical engineer um, she also uh, joined the civil service and progressively advanced uh, to various 
positions uh, throughout that enterprise to include uh, recently serving as the deputy of uh, program of ex executive office for uh, soldier systems and, and equipment. And she currently in her, uh, in her current position oversees all of the labs and uh, research development engineering centers in the Army enterprise. So uh, she spent her life talking to, talking about technology to various audiences and as have all of our panelists in various capacities and from a bunch of different perspectives. So uh, Mary, thanks for agreeing to moderate this panel and we very much look forward to all of your insights. Thank you, Mary. I'm excited to moderate this panel because it means that I get to moderate. I don't have to answer the questions, and that's a novelty for me, so that, that's good news. And I'm going to keep my comments brief because I think the real uh, genesis of this is to be able to do the question and answer phase. Um, given that technology is embedded within our lives, and it's really important that we understand how to best communicate this, as a technology provider, this is critical for all of us. But as the leader of this Army Science and Technology Investment and an engineer myself, I see the struggles that we have. I often depict my role as the big translator between the folks that actually do technology, and I don't consider myself one these days because I'm in the Pentagon, and those that actually have to understand what we're doing and understand the rationale for it. But I am an engineer. We're not really known for communicating very well, and in fact, we're not really known for being very um, extroverted in how we do outreach. So communications is always a challenge. A friend of mine came up and, and they told me, and yes, it's a joke, but they told me this, and it was kind of revealing. They said, how do you determine an introverted, introverted engineer from an extroverted engineer? And I said, okay, I don't know how. The extroverted engineer will be looking at your shoes. Mm -hmm. Right? So it kind of just goes to the larger problem we have. We don't communicate all that well. But I've learned a few fundamentals all the way through my career. And one is when you are trying to communicate, you really need to first understand the audience that you're going to be talking to. And I'll give you an example of how this matters. In my office, I get a lot of support personnel that are donated uh, scientists and engineers from the larger science and technology enterprise, our research laboratories, our research development engineering centers. And one of the things that always surprises them when they come to the Pentagon is they have these great aspirations of being able to communicate the great technology work that they're doing and all of its details. And they believe that the general officers and senior executive service corps that they're going to be talking to will get it. And that's really, frankly, not true. I'll give you an example. We had a very enthusiastic developer of armor that was writing an information paper for the then vice chief of staff of the Army about some great breakthroughs that we had in armor development. And the information paper goes on to say, that we went from an aerial density for armor of 120 pounds per square foot to an aerial density of 90 pounds per square foot. And he's like, see? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, so that's really good technically. That is the scientific method, message. But the vice chief doesn't get that. So what you need to do is to translate that into weight savings on a platform because that's an operational impact that a soldier will understand. So he does some math, and he comes back and he said, well, on the MRF that we were talking about, that change in aerial density saves me 12,000 pounds. And because of that, I have all of my equipment on that platform doesn't break down because of the added weight. My fuel efficiency is better, and he goes on to list all of these positive attributes. And I said, that's the kind of translation to the audience, Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, that you need to have. It's one of those manage expectations kind of deals. You, you heard on the last panel from Dan Adams. He is a staffer on the Hill. This is another challenge we have. When we talk to staffers, sometimes we find people that have a technical background. Often we find people that don't. What they really need to know is not that you're smart. They assume you're smart or you wouldn't be where you are. They need to know what's the so what of this investment in technology you're making. 
And how do we make sure that it has an impact for, in my case, the Army? And that goes back to basic principles, using simple language to understand. We, we as scientists and engineers often get caught up in our, our techno jargon, for lack of a better term. We think we're pretty cool. We, we have a little community. We all talk the same technical language. That's something that we need to work on. And I've got to tell you, as a person who works for the military, we make it even worse. Because we add to that these things called acronyms. Acronyms are horrible for communication. I'll tell you just a quick example. We were talking to my boss, the Army Acquisition Executive, and it was actually we were talking about our cyber investments and our technology path forward. And the team talking to her was talking about our work in DECO and OCO. And it took on to chart 13 of the briefing before she finally has this eureka moment that OCO that they were talking about wasn't overseas contingency operations, which is a type of funding that we utilize, but it was really offensive cyber operations. So now 13 pages into the briefing, she finally gets that, wait, she's been kind of tracking something a little bit differently. That wasn't her shortfall, because she's very bright. She's a systems engineer. And for me, it's been actually refreshing to have somebody who understands technology in my leadership chain. But it was a lack of communications and the lack of knowledge that we were miscommunicating. And that's something that we all are struggling with. So those are, you know, key things that are important to us, how we better communicate. What I'm going to do now is introduce the rest of the panel, and they're going to tell us some of their ways that they've found to communicate effectively. And I will tell you that as somebody that has to communicate for a living what technology is doing, I look forward to some of their good ideas. So first on my left is Ms. Jessica Tozer. She is from the Department of Defense Science and Technology. She is a Department of Defense Science and Technology writer who currently serves as the content manager and editor in chief through the Armed with Science, the official Department of Defense Science and Technology blog. She is a lifelong science fiction fan. When we did our prep session, we talked about that, <laughs> and a published science fiction and fantasy author. Next to her is Mr. Rick Weiss. Director of Strategic Communications at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. Mr. Weiss is a science and technology policy advisor to the DARPA director and honed his skills while in the same role at the White, at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Mr. Weiss also spent 15 years as a science and medical writer for the Washington Post. Now, I'm really intrigued to hear what he has to say because from my perspective, DARPA's got the best communication strategy out there within the Department of Defense. Next to Rick is Ms. Tiffany Lowater, Director of Meetings and Public Engagement, American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. Ms. Lowater is responsible for the AAAS Annual Meeting and the Center for Public Engagement with Science and Technology. Ms. Lowater's work encourages scientists to take a more personal and proactive interest in public engagement. I'll go back to many of us are introverts. That's a challenge. And finally, wrapping up the panel, Dr. Kevin Cordy, Global Director of Technology from DuPont. Dr. Cordy leads a global technology organization that develops advanced materials in the area of high strength and high temperature fibers technical non-wovens, including nanofiber non-wovens, and new applications across a spectrum of end use markets. Dr. Corby has led research and development in several DuPont businesses, including some that may be familiar to this audience, such as Mylar, Tyvek, and Kevlar. So thank you to the panel. Now they will give their opening comments. Well, hello. I'm Jessica Tozer. I am a Department of Defense contractor, and I run Armed with Science, the Department of Defense Science and Technology blog, which, in my opinion, is one of the coolest jobs you can have in the Department of Defense, because I get to talk about all the most amazing science and technology research and development that happens within the spectrum of the Department of Defense and the military, which is really big. We have a lot of stuff that we have a chance to do. But I have a very unique position, because I have to take 
what I would call techno babble, and have it make sense to both internal and external audiences. So I reach both um, civilians who would probably never have even heard about what uh, certain things are, or they don't know the difference between a rail gun and a laser, and there is a difference. Um, or the, and then I also have internal audiences, people who are in the military, people who work within the research labs, who want to know more about these types of projects. So I sort of have to mirror the techno babble, um, which can be sort of very complicated, sometimes extremely complicated, and have it translate to something that makes sense to everyone. And I actually use a method that I call the Star Trek method to do this. And if any of you have watched Star Trek, and I hope that at least somebody here has besides me, uh, you'll know that they have this habit of using complicated phrases and then summing it up in a really easy to understand metaphor. So they'll say something like, well, we found these Decaon field particles in Data's positronic subnet, and you're like, what? And then Jordi will say, well, if I was going to send a message to Data through subspace, that's how I would do it. And you're like, oh, that's what I did, of course, I, the, by the positronic net, whatever. And so that's kind of how I do that. I, I, so I'll say something that's very complicated. So we'll talk about nanoparticles or um, photonics and these kinds of things. And I'll say, and this is why it matters. This is why science matters to you. Because this silicon nanowire for porous electrode is neat. But it's also something that can detect chemicals, like a tricorder. So I find ways of m like mirroring the real science with what would make sense to uh, generalized audiences. Because in my opinion, science fiction is the aperture for science future. A lot of these people who created these things, they started because they said, when I grew up, I watched this. I watched Battlestar Galactica, I watched Star Trek, I watched Doctor Who, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if this technology existed in real life? And then they grow up to develop these technologies to understand what could be the applicable science behind it. And they create these devices. But the problem is, um, like Mary said, a lot of the, the, the technologists, the engineers, the scientists of this community understand their role very well. They understand the science and the technology very well, which is great. You should want that. But it doesn't always translate in generalized terms when they try to explain it. I'll get this 35-page white paper, and I'll go, oh, God, there's so much this that doesn't make sense. And then I read it like 50 times, and, and then I find a way to, to make it make sense. So it's sort of like I am, in some ways, like a techno-translator. Um, I can see something and say, okay, so here's this technology. Well, what do you want it to do? What do you hope this will achieve? Okay, well, we hope that it will achieve the ability to detect chemicals in the environment. Okay, and how big is it going to be? Well, it's going to be about the size of the computer chip. Okay, can it go on anything? Well, it can go on your phone. Okay, so you basically put a tricorder chip you can put on your phone. Well, that's sort of like what, it, you know, that the science isn't going to be exact. We aren't actually creating transporters, at least not successfully yet, um, and those kinds of things. But the ideas that we're pushing forward, the science and technology that we're pushing forward, has roots in things that people understand because they were once just imaginary things. Everything that has existed came about because somebody dreamed that it would be possible. And that's where I use the focus to write my stories. And I also use um, social media. So I also run the, the like, Facebook and the Twitter page and stuff like that. And I think when it comes to communication in science and technology, that social media is imperative at this point in our lives. People get more information from Facebook when events happen in their lives. If there's an earthquake, if there's a shooting, people go to Facebook before they go anywhere else. And so you have this audience that exists in this realm so if you can grasp that and speak in the right terms, then you can embrace it, be part of the conversation, and in some cases, even drive your own conversation. So you can actually control how people are saying things about the things that you want them to talk about, which is why science and technology in general can do really well in social media. And DARPA is actually a good example of this, and I'll let you talk about that. But DARPA is great with social media. They post a picture of a robot walking, and they get like 700,000 retweets. I mean, but that's what people want to see. They want to see what this stuff is and why it should matter to them. So I created a, a slogan for Arbor Science that says, Science Matters. And to me, that translates in many different ways. Science matters in so many different avenues. And if you can use the right tools, and speak the right language, I think the communication will go so far in helping people to understand why it's cool, why it's important, why it's imperative to the social progression of our society. And I think that in that regard, that's not only the best part, but it's how we succeed as communicators.
Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think I have the coolest job, Me actually. Do. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> you might be a close second. I hope everyone feels like they have the coolest job because you spend so much of your life doing it, you might as well think it's cool. Um, so DARPA, as I think most people know, is, is an agency in the DOD that invests in particular in sort of breakthrough technologies, not the ordinary stuff. Um, to my mind, uh, and I propose this as our motto, but it hasn't really gotten any traction in officialdom, but it, uh, wh when I go in there and talk to people about what they're up to in DARPA every day, the phrase that keeps coming to mind for me is one that my teenage daughter is always saying, which is, wait, what? <laughs> because there's just so many surprises uh, under development all the time that you didn't really think were possible, but that are being actually made possible by uh, scientists and engineers. So it's, it's great fun, and I think part of our challenge is to convey how much fun and how interesting it is, but of course, to keep in mind the larger purpose, and the larger pur purpose and the mission for DARPA is to bring technologies to bear for national security, and that's the thing that we try to keep in mind all the time in our work and what we try to keep conveying in our communications, that this is all about ultimately national security. That's our first responsibility. Many times, of course, things spin off in various directions and become great commercial hits and become important to people in their day-to-day -day lives. I hope we all use the internet every day. We all use miniaturized GPS every day. Uh, so these are great spin-offs, but national security is our game and that's what we focus on. Um, I thought I would just take a couple of minutes to talk about some of the challenges and some of the uh, approaches we take to overcoming those challenges in the communication sphere, and then mostly leave it up to questions to get into any specifics. I think there are two levels of challenges that we face in communications at DARPA, and one of them is generic, and it's one that uh, Jessica mentioned, which is just, first of all, it's, it's a challenge for all science writing. Can you get people interested who might not normally be interested? Um, many of you probably read recently about the recent death of Ben Bradley, the former executive editor of the Washington Post, who uh, was a great executive editor at the Post, but he did have, I'd say, one uh, weak point, and that was he did not have an appreciation of science. And in the days that he ran the Post, science did not have a high profile there. In fact, he had invented a beat that some of you may have heard about called Smirsch. And Smirsch was the beat that covered those reporters who wrote about science, medicine, education, religion, and all that. I'll let you fill in the blank for the SH. And that's kind of where you were if you were a science reporter at the Post. Luckily, I think interest levels have grown over the last couple of decades, and that's less of a problem now. But you still have the second generic problem, which is how to explain science to such you know, a broad array of people who you're trying to reach, which uh, Jessica also mentioned. You know, at, in journalism, you've got everyone from, you know, when we would write medical stories, everyone from the scientists at NIH and NSF who are reading those stories and who are going to ding you if you get the slightest thing wrong. But you've also got people who are plunking a quarter in the box, and mostly for the sports section, and you want to make sure that they can understand what you've written also. And it's the same in public affairs at DARPA. We've got uh, scientists who are looking very closely to make sure we've got it exactly accurate and who will complain if you're wrong. And you've got people who are less educated, uh, congressmen in some cases, uh, and other stakeholders who just don't have the education or the background uh, in science and to whom it's very important uh, we get our message across. So those are generic problems that always face science writers. I think in DARPA in particular, there are some particulars we have to deal with. Um, one is these uh, misconceptions, I'd say, about DARPA. One is the presumption that everything at DARPA is secret anyway. You know, when I told people I was going to take the communications job at DARPA, people said, well, that'll be easy because it's all secret. <laughs> you don't even have to tell anyone anything. Uh, that's not true, and we actually have a very busy shop. You know, we're taking 25 to 40 media inquiries a week, uh, pretty much all of which we're quite responsive to. So we, we tell a lot about what we're doing, actually. Uh, another misconception is that if a reporter could come to DARPA, they could see all this cool stuff. And the, the sort of disappointing <laughs> bottom line is that there is nothing to see at DARPA. There's a bunch of offices, mostly with people writing contracts, because, of course, we fund work that gets done elsewhere in academia and industry, mostly. So it's a hugely boring place to come if you're a reporter. And, and a lot of people don't want to believe us when we tell them there's nothing to see here. Um, you have a lovely one. break room. We do have a nice, nice couple of nice rooms. Uh, and once in a while, if you're lucky, there's a robot in the lobby for a while, but then he goes away. Uh, another misconception is that we're uh, a policy shop of some kind, and we, sh you know, we should be able to be responsive to questions about, well, what are we going to you know, do?
do with this kind of technology or what's the right policy, you know, what should we do about, you know, privacy and autonomy and things like that. We address those things in part because the nature of our work is such that we often are the first ones to brush up against some interesting policy areas that are not already addressed and that are going to need to be addressed because suddenly we've got a capability that gets you into a space you weren't in before. But it's not our job, really, to create policy. We are a projects agency. That's the P in DARPA, and we're working on projects. Uh, another misconception that some reporters and others get hung up on is that we should be a, a, you know, into STEM education. We should be out there educating the public. We do do a lot to educate the public, but again, it's not our main purpose in life. You, know, you can't help but attract school kids if you've got robots, and we have a lot of robots, it's true. So, um, you know, we, we take on that role as, as best as we can. Robots and other technologies actually are a great entree to get kids interested in engineering and science, and we try to try to work that, but it's not, again, our main responsibility. And, and maybe the last, and not the biggest, but sort of the most painful uh, misperception about DARPA is that we are responsible for your personal psychiatric problem. Um, we, there are many, many people who seem to think that we have done things to them. Um, <laughs> can I just tell everyone? We're not doing it, okay? It's not us. Um, actually, I, I once saw a, uh, an interview with a former DARPA director, this goes back to the 70s, who related the great solution to this problem back in the days when it was easy to get a phone call into the, into the highest offices at DARPA, and there was a person, one person in particular, who was calling, uh, saying, you know, please turn off the chip in my brain. This is a particularly difficult thing to talk about because we actually are putting chips in brains now, <laughs> but not for what they think. Um, and uh, kept calling back because they had no relief. And finally, the secretary had a great idea, uh, according to this DARPA director, and told the person, please hold on a minute, and put the person on hold for two minutes. And then came back on and said, we turned it off. And the person never called back. So <laughs> maybe that's the solution. Anyway, uh, just quickly in terms of the things that we do uh, to try to uh, get our message out and to be effective, um, we, of course, have our website, which we update all the time, in which we try to write interesting features about the new technologies that we're working on and the milestones they hit as, as they get hit. We do use social media a lot, and we try to have some fun with it. Um, you know, for better, not for better, there's no worse here. For better, we have a little bit of a long leash from sort of, you know, DOD and the Office of the Secretary. They let us do our thing as long as we don't cause trouble. And we, we have some fun with social media, which is the way to make that work. Uh, when the CIA came out with their sort of much ballyhooed first tweet uh, last year, which was a kind of a funny tweet also about, uh, we cannot confirm or deny that this is really our first tweet. Um, <laughs> DARPA responded saying, if you want to really be that secretive, maybe you should try some of our vapor software. Vapor is a program where we're making microelectronics that just dissolve into thin air and go away, sort of Mission Impossible style. We made note uh, last week that it was coincidentally the 45th anniversary of the birth of the internet, first message across the ARPANET, and National Cat Day. And we don't think that's a coincidence given how much of the internet is spent with cat pictures and movies. But anyway. Uh, we do a lot of media outreach, we do media calls, we, uh, we hold sort of uh, briefings on the phone to make sure reporters are familiar with the research that we're doing. Our director and others uh, spend a fair amount of time on the road going out and speaking uh, to various audiences, uh, young and old, industry and academia. Um, we have our challenges, the DARPA challenges, which started years ago with the original DARPA challenge to get a driverless car going which uh, some of you may recall was a total failure on the first round. Not a single car made it to the finish line. You can see where that, you know, uh, where that has ended up today. Most of the people in the Google arena and other areas where driverless cars are happening had their start at the DARPA, uh, initial, initial DARPA challenge. Challenges are all about getting new communities of researchers together that might not have been together before to take on a challenge that needs a little bit of juice. And by setting a goal and putting out a prize first, it's amazing how much energy and, and, uh, and investment you can spur. <laughs> Oftentimes, a bigger investment than the prize purse itself is just a great way because people want to get bragging rights. Uh, we've got the DARPA Robotics Challenge that we're in the midst of right now. Finals will be out in Pomona, California in June, which is going to be a, a spectacular event that we think is going to attract something like eight to 10,000 people per day over a couple of periods to watch these robots effectively duke it out on a bunch of tasks having to do with humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. 
Um, we've got a chikungunya challenge going on right now to predict the spread of a disease that's creeping up from Latin America up to the United States right now, which we think will energize the disease uh, and epidemiology modeling community, something that's quite important in light of the recent Ebola outbreak. So challenges are a great way of attracting people and getting the word out on new science. So, Rick, right. mm -hmm. can we move on? And one minute. And <laughs> the last thing I mentioned is <laughs> an open catalog uh, where we are publishing on the web all the literature that, we, uh, that our scientists are publishing in the open literature. Um, so that we can be part of the open government initiative that the administration is behind. I'm sorry to go so long. Go ahead. <laughs> Tiffany, thank Hi. you. So um, I'm here from AAAS, which is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, some of you hopefully are, are familiar with what AAAS does. One of the things that we do that I think might be particularly relevant for this group is um, offer scientists and engineers training in how to communicate about the research. Um, and so we have worked with government agencies as well as individual um, academic institutions, lots of different groups on how to do that. One of the things I always talk to scientists and engineers about is you need to be thinking about who your audience is and your message. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tips that we use. And um, if anyone's interested in learning more about our workshops, we have a website I'll give you at triplef.org slash communicating science. And we'd be happy to work with you and talk to you about what your needs are. Um, but specifically, I think about audience and message. Um, many scientists and engineers who are very involved in their work um, are, are very interested in getting their information to audiences that they're very comfortable with. So experts are comfortable in their own expertise and they're comfortable talking to other experts about that expertise. I think sometimes when they're looking to talk to public audiences, this is when we run into challenges. They may not be familiar with the, what those public audiences know, what they care about, what's relevant to them. And so um, often I, I ha ask scientists to step back from the content for a minute and think about who is your audience, who is it you're speaking to, what is it that they want to know? What is it that their concern, uh, concerns are? Um, it's not about you, it's about them. Okay? It's that whole, like, it's not me, it's you. Um, it, it really is about the person that you're talking to. Um, and it, obviously that varies based on the kind of platform you're using for communication. If it's online, if it's social media, you have potentially a vast audience. If it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a congressperson or a staffer, that's a much different kind of audience. So thinking about and getting as much information as you can about your audience is really important. Um, secondly, um, we talk a lot about how scientists often have lots of messages, <laughs> lots of information, too much information sometimes to enable them to have more of a conversation. So uh, instead of doing a data dump, um, really thinking about what are the key things you want the person to walk away from in this conversation or in this communication. Um, I know I'm, I'm familiar in military, there's this bottom line up front. I think that's really important, you know, the so what that other people have talked about. So what for them? Not necessarily your so what. We really have to think about it in their, in their terms. Um, you need to be willing to listen. If someone's asking you a question, answer the question instead of telling them what you think they should know. Right? <laughs> it's, it's a different way of thinking. Um, so if you're asked a question about your work, think about how you can actually relate that back to the person in a way they can understand. They're probably asking because they don't understand what you're talking about. So you need to think about how to better explain what it is they're doing. Um, and I think language, we've talked a bit about acronyms and jargon. This is a real challenge for most people who are in technical work. Uh, I don't think scientists, engineers, and definitely not defense-related researchers are the only people who have this problem. I, I like to say that this is an issue of expertise, not necessarily science and engineering. When you have so much data to, and you, you shorten it, you need to think about how do you then project that to people who don't know those short terms. Um, and, and keep in mind that those I think uh, you have made the, 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 the acronyms mean different things to different people. <laughs> Jargon's the same way. Even among scientists, when you get them in a room, you use certain words and they mean things in different fields. So you think about, for the people who don't have those expertise, how do you relate the information? Um, one other thing I think is important, and I think particularly in our, in our current political climate, how do we interact and communicate in a way that's productive? Right? We, confrontation can sometimes happen maybe not so useful for the goals that you have for your communication. So we need to be thinking about how can we have a constructive conversation? How can we continue to have conversations that maybe um, allay some of those concerns? It's something to think about. Um, and also, it, it gets back to before what I was saying about bottom line up front. Start with what you want the person to remember from what you're going to say. So I started by saying audiences and messages are good communication. That's what I want you to remember for what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. Always be thinking about how do you get people to think, what is it that is important to them, and how can you communicate that first? Um, I think many scientists and engineers who are in the research community are very um, familiar in communicating with the details at the very beginning. 
And then at the very end of the, any scientific paper, probably the 30-page reports you're talking about, here's what we found, right? Most people want to know, here's what we found very first, mm -hmm. and then why should I care? And so it, almost everyone that you interact with will want to know those, those questions. So you just thinking about practicing, how do, you, how do you do that? And that was the other piece I was going to say. Practicing is really important. Talk to your family and your friends about what it is that you do. Let them ask you questions. Try to answer and respond to them. I speak to many scientists who are fearful of the person who sits down next to them in an airplane and says, so what do you do? <laughs> this is a wonderful opportunity for a new person to, to try to understand what is it that you do. <laughs> because I think that um, you, know, you can better understand through other people's eyes what you're working on. If they actually ask questions that make you think about what it is that you're doing. And that's a valuable skill to have. That's what I wanted to say. Again, the website is slash communicating science. And I'd be happy to talk with anyone afterwards as well. Thank you. And Kevin. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm the guy from private industry that slipped into the room. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, the question of uh, effectively communicating science and technology is you know, equally important in industry as it is in um, governmental agencies and you know, in many, many parallels. Uh, maybe in some cases there's a, even a, more of a sense of urgency. I, I mean, in, in industry, uh, Science and technology is an investment choice, and 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 we have, uh, you know, we're always challenged to meet the expectations of our investors and quarterly profits. And uh, business leaders can easily turn around and say, you know, let's just cut that investment in research. You know, if they're not convinced that it's meaningful for the business, it, it's a very very easy decision for them to make. And so, you know, we constantly have to make sure that their understanding, you know, why science and technology is important to the business. So, um, so I, I think the subject matter is extremely important and, uh, and uh, glad, glad that somebody uh, decided to have this forum. So who are key stakeholders in industry? And we have many stakeholders, but I think uh, as pertains to science and technology, there's two main ones. The first one is, of course, our business leaders because they make the budgetary and policy decisions. Uh, and then there's our customers, uh, ultimately, because if we want to introduce some new technology, it, it will take some investment on their part to commercialize it. So those are the, really the two key stakeholders I'm thinking about when we're thinking about communicating science and technology. So uh, how do, what do we do? And I'll try and maybe uh, propose some tips and examples of how we do things, and probably things you've heard already in a lot of cases. But I like to think that it, it does start with us in the, in the science community. You know, we need to recognize it's an important part of the job, and it's a part of the job that we don't often like to do. Uh, Mary said before, a lot of technical people are introverts. I find that there's another attribute that's really important that, that hinders their communication, and that's the incredible humility of scientists and engineers. Uh, I, I always have this um, feeling that I'm going to go down and say, you know, what you've been up to lately? You know, what, what, how's your work going? What have you found? And, and they'll say, well, you know, last, yesterday I discovered cold fu how to solve cold fusion. <laughs> and you say, holy man, you know, people have been trying to do that for decades. Do you know what that means? And, and the next response will be, yeah, but 99% of it was already known. And, and my part was only a little part, okay? And say, well, okay. But, you know, that, that's the mindset of a lot of technical people. And uh, it's that humility that comes out because, in fact, science and technology progresses in increments. And the breakthrough only comes when that next increment crosses some threshold. But they're, what they're seeing is the increment that they did, and they don't want to brag about the, you know, the, the, the totality of the innovation that occurred over a period of time. So how do you, how do you get past that, that factor with um, technical people? Well, I think one key point that's come up again and again is try to teach um, technologists and scientists to communicate about how what they've done meets the needs and interests of their stakeholders. Communicate the benefits. The science will be embedded in, in how you communicate the, 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 the benefits, ultimately. Now, in private industry, you know, our stakeholders want to know, how is this going to increase our market share? 
how's it going to, this offering going to uh, improve our competitive position? Well, you, pretty soon you start talking about, well, the, the offering, the performance attributes that you know, have addressed trade-offs in a better way than other materials, and, and then pretty soon you, the question will be, why does it do that? And, and the science will come out. But the hook is always really around the benefits and, and how you meet the interests and needs of, of the stakeholders. Uh, I'm going to change tax a little bit. I, I think there's another thing that's important in institutions, and that is to make sure there are rituals and forums around technology. Uh, our business leaders uh, across the company in DuPont, and every single one, they, they have a monthly business review. I mean, they want to know how are sales going, and, you know, what are costs look like, you know, what are, how are we progressing against the quarterly expectations. I make sure that in every one of those monthly business meetings, there's an agenda topic on technology. Because ultimately, you know, our work is projectized, and it should be projectized around the needs of the business leaders. And there's, there are always decisions that need to be made when these things are in flight. Do we need to accelerate it? Do we need more money? Do we need to, do we have the opportunity to reduce the spending because maybe they have a need to do it? But this brings the, the stakeholders into the, uh, into the process of technology on a regular basis. So it, it's not a one-off, one time a year where all of a sudden they, you know, they, they hear a, a little, bit about technology. Uh, now, speaking of every year, I mean, we also have an annual technology conference where we invite business leaders from all around the company. We even invite customers to it. There are poster sessions and workshops and presentations. And uh, this is, you know, intended to en enhance the networking of our technology community around the world, but also uh, engage our business leaders in a better way. So it, you, you schedule this way, way in advance, so it's a bit of a, if you will, a deeper dive on technology where they can see a lot more and learn a lot more. So our CEO always comes to that, and that sets a good tone. As soon as the CEO comes, all the business leaders automatically sign up, you know. It, that's, so it's important. I, I, the last thing, and other people have said this, is audience matters. Uh, for us, you know, getting to the decision makers for, for me is very important. I, I talked about our customers. If we want to uh, bring a new technology to market, uh, often the customers are not really our direct customers. We, we sell to a lot of people that distribute our product. Uh, but the, the people we need to get to are the people that ultimately use the product so we can convince them of what it's doing for them. So it's getting multiple steps or at least past the direct interface to where it really makes a difference. Uh, in, we see, feel that in government. Um, we're steps down the value chain in, in from what the government needs, right? The government usually works with prime contractors. We're a material supplier to prime contractors. And so how do we get our message to people in government agencies about material innovations so it isn't several steps away and we can't get it to get the message to the right people? So. Getting past the direct interface, getting to where the people will really appreciate the innovation and, and understand the value of it. So anyway, it it's, uh, starts with us. I think always focus on the benefits and value that it brings. Establish rituals. That, that trains the technical people as well to make sure that on a regular basis they have to get up and communicate and talk and engage the stakeholders on a regular basis and make sure that you're getting to the right people and stakeholders that ultimately make the decisions on whether you're going to have funding to continue to do what you do. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So now we'll open up for questions. When you have a question, I'd ask that you introduce yourself and where you're from. And then we'll go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm Mike McGrath. I'm a consultant. I'm a DARPA alum. and. Uh, formerly had the job that uh, Mary Lacey has and that is similar to Mary Miller's. Before they changed the rule, that was a big improvement to require that your name be Mary. <laughs> um, so I, I uh, am very much in tune with the, the theme that we underachieve on technology communication often. But sometimes we overachieve. 
and that leads to Gartner's famous uh, hype curve. And, and that has real consequences when something gets overhyped. Um, I, I look at all the press coverage uh, lately of 3D printing, additive manufacturing, which leaves you with the impression that we're going to have the Star Trek replicator and everybody's going to have one in their garage. Um, and, and what happens is um, when you reach this trough of disillusionment, it becomes very difficult to get funding to do work. Let's say you, you had an idea for cold fusion. Good luck getting funding on that. So, so my question is, uh, have you encountered problems where um, hype starts to occur, and how do you manage expectations? What do you do in communications to, to manage expectations? Is, is that one for me? Or? Anyone can take it. Does anyone want to? I have, I can. I, well, I have a good example of why uh, hype can sometimes be a, a difficult thing. And I think when it comes to communication in general, hype is always going to be an issue, especially if you're addressing large audiences and it's something that they don't understand very well. And I will use the recent example of the Ebola crisis, where uh, many like officials were trying to get ahead of the story and it just ran. And it became this whole, and everyone was convinced it was going to come and kill off millions of Americans like last month, and that Texas was going to be locked down, and they had zombie apocalypse references. It was a mess. Um, and, and unfortunately, you sort of anticipate that there's going to be that kind of problem when it comes to things like that. And that one was in particular very difficult. And at this point now, I think a lot of the media has wrangled that back in and been like, oh, all right, let's just calm down and figure out what we're really dealing with here. And when it comes to hype, I think that that's really what happens is, is um, for example, I did a story, I interviewed General Alexander right after um, the Edward Snowden thing happened, and that became an enormous story. And there was a lot of conjecture that happened, there was a lot of opinions, people were mad, people had very polarized opinions on this, so hype happened. And the best that, uh, thing that I came up to deal with and that my leadership did was let's just stay the course. Let's use our plan. Let's talk about the things we were supposed to talk about. Let's give the NSA their opportunity to say their words and not give our opinions. Just let the NSA carry their message. And eventually that ended up being the best option because we had gone up there and be like, you don't know what you're talking about. We have some other, you know, that wouldn't have done any good. It would probably have made things worse. Um, so when it comes to hype, I, I figure, in my, in my experience, that sometimes that does happen, but the best thing that you can do is to continue to remain truthful to the concepts, to the ideas, to whatever it is that you're dealing with, because you're not going to be able to control everybody's reaction to things, but you can control how you react to it. And so that's sort of, and the 3D printing, by the way, is very cool. I've seen a lot of that stuff, too, so. <laughs> can, I, can I also answer, well, I, I think, because I'm thinking more along the lines of individual technology, which I think is what you were what you were mentioning. So I actually think the, the scientist or whoever's communicating that has some responsibility to, to maintain, at least from their perspective, um, boundaries. You know, this is what this did, this is what it didn't do. This is what still needs to be done. There's a timeline for that. Um, and I think um, most scientists who are really thinking thoughtfully in advance of how they're going to describe that work, or engineers or technology developers, can do that in a way that's um, appreciated by the person that they're speaking to. And I, but I do think that they should be upfront with that information and not just wait for someone to ask a question, particularly if it's something that's very early on in the process that then needs a much more work to be done to it. Um, and basic scientists that we work with all the time struggle with this because they want to provide the connections and the relevance to societal issues and what the impacts could be, but they realize that their work is so much um, further from what that actually happening. So helping them think through how do you talk about those things is really helpful. Okay. I'm Maren Wade from CSIS. Um, I wanted to ask any of you who would care to address it. Um, I think a number of you deal with both hard and soft sciences um, and whether there is um, a different set of challenges or whether they are the same in uh, sometimes social sciences. Well, I just, your perspectives on whether whether, whether you talk about them in the same way, are there the same issues in communicating about them um, how do the audiences uh, react to talking about uh, some things that are more intuitive 
to some and less intuitive to others and vice versa. Well, we, we don't think those are real sciences. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I actually find that um, social science can be very difficult to explain as well, and they're not necessarily better communicators, <laughs> um, even though you would think. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that there are challenges between them. And I also think sometimes the implications of, um, of hard sciences, really, you really need a better understanding of the social science, sciences, which sometimes the hard sciences scientists have a hard time connecting to, because that's not their field. Um, so sometimes connecting those individuals together to provide a message can be really compelling. Here's the hard science, here's the social science that's going on, here's what we're taking care of to, to address both of all of these issues. Um, but I, but I, yes, I, I think there are some unique challenges um, but amongst specific disciplines of science, but, but often similar ones too. I sure. weigh in because I have to defend in the Army's world not only the hard sciences, which for me as an engineer is much easier, but also the software, cognitive, social skills, and especially right now the Army is really looking into this thing that we call human dimension, which has all sorts of meanings depending on who you ask, right? But I'm finding that the, the softer science is harder to communicate, as difficult as technology is to communicate in general. The softer science, you're now talking about individuals and you're talking about things like cognition and their ability to learn based on how they have been educated. It's all individual, which is kind of anti-army anyway. Where kind of group think, we, we, we <laughs> that sounds bad too, but you know, we train as a unit, we operate as a unit, we have squads, we have teams, all the soldiers are you know, brought up the same way, they have their discipline, and so it's kind of hard to go on this kind of individual softer science. It has been a challenge, everyone kind of gets it's important, but it's hard to communicate the metrics, what are we, what are we judged against, how do we say we're successful, what, what does that look like? It's a new way to look at things. We're still working our way through how to better address that. Yeah, I have to redeem myself because of my comment. I was meant only in, in humor, but I, I, I have to agree with Mary that I think the, a big challenge, it, it's a more difficult challenge to communicate. And, and, and of course, the scientific method is, is much more difficult. I, I, you can't, uh, you know, establishing a control from which to work from is, is it's much more difficult, right? So, you know, how you approach the, the scientific approach and, and draw specific conclusions. Uh, typically, you have to use a lot of statistical methods and, and, and those types of things. So it's, it's, um, it's you know, not, it doesn't have that same um, uh, ease of, of, of communicating cause and effect that, you know, some of the hard sciences do. So one, one area I would mention I think there's an interesting intersection happening of sort of soft and hard science, as you put it, as the computational and big data resources that we're getting better and better at now are starting to get applied to the social science arena, and in particular in the social media arena that we were talking about earlier. So I think uh, social sciences, and in particular studies of behavior and predictions of behavior through social media, is a very fast growing field and one that's going to make social science much more real to people and I think it's going to make people increasingly uncomfortable because it's getting better and better at figuring out why people are doing things, what they're probably going to do, how groups form, how do groups decide what they believe and, and how do you know, you know what's true and what's not true and all the information that is flowing around us. So I think it's a huge growth area and it will it's already becoming more scientific and probably will be uh, increasingly uh, uh, difficult for people to feel comfortable about as it gets better. Uh, I'm just interested in what strategies you would have uh, for deciding when to stay silent, not secret, but silent versus when to put it out there? And I really think you <laughs> would probably have a good answer for this. Uh, I think it depends on what it is and what your goals are. You know? So um, it depends. There's so many unknowns, like I'd have to talk to you specifically about the issue. Well, sometimes things get hijacked. Mm. You know, all of a sudden, I've had, people, I've had people tell me about what I'm doing, and it has nothing to do with what I'm doing. 
Yeah, so I think you have to be able to describe what it is that you are doing and what you're not doing. Um, and, and I think that there's value in doing that. Um, you know, we are looking at a range of things. Here's the thing that I'm focusing on. Other people may be doing other things. That's not what I'm doing. Um, as far as like an issue and making an issue more public or more known, um, I think we are seeing more and more uh, that becomes outside of your control uh, because of things like social media. Uh, so I think, I, always, I actually think being proactively thinking about how to, um, how to have public conversations about issues, regardless of whether or not you want them to be known or not, they're probably going to be known at some point. Um, someone could take it and make it a big deal. And so we need to be prepared for how do we handle those conversations once they come up. Um, and one of the things I don't think I got to earlier was, you know, thinking ahead. So um, this is what I would like it to, this is how I would like things to go. This is how it may go. This is how I hope it doesn't go. And planning for each of those scenarios, I think, is really important. I think we run the most challenges when we, when we cut, catch ourselves unawares of the conversation that's already happening around us. Um, I've actually encouraged some, uh, I'm just going to move real quick. Sorry. <laughs> um, for, in the government, there are, um, leadership has gotten better in the last couple of years, I would say, in embracing social media in particular, because there was a point, and I was in the army, I was a soldier once, uh, so I took a lot of orders, and they said, no, we're not going to talk about anything ever. And uh, so social media is going to happen, whether you want it to be there or not. And uh, there was leadership in the military uh, in the last few years has really embraced that, especially um, the Secretary of Defense and the Pentagon Press Secretary. They're really good at sort of seizing this and saying, okay, this is a platform that exists. But there was a time when they didn't want to have any social media interaction. And I used to argue um, to the effect that doing that is to your detriment because then other people are carrying a conversation for you, whether you like it or not. They're going to tell you what you're doing if you, even if you're not doing it. So being able to say, okay, this is a thing that exists, and if this is, a, if this is an arena that exists, and this is a place that con these conversations are happening, let's be a part of it. And I think that, that in the recent years, uh, DOD in particular has gotten much, much better at that. We'll have a much stronger social media presence, which has been much to their benefit, I would think. If you didn't introduce yourself. I'm Jennifer Brodsky with Boston University, and Rick, you alluded to the fact that the work that happens with the DARPA funds is not happening in your building, it's happening elsewhere, and I wondered if maybe you and Jessica could talk about how you engage with your extramural partners at universities or companies, if at all, and maybe what we could do that would be helpful to you to, to getting the message out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thanks. It, it, is, it is a complicated communications issue because it's, we don't own our all of our stuff, right? So I can't control what we communicate about our stuff. It's mostly being done by other people. The, the policy around communications by partners or performers who are doing DARPA-funded work at DARPA is pretty straightforward. Um, if you're doing 6.1 or, or usually 6.2 work in basic research, which we think is just, you know, there ought to be just freedom to publish and you should go talk about your work, that's fine. There's, you just go ahead and do your own thing, put out a press release if you, if your scientists uh, make some kind of an advance, and and we don't really get in the way, um, we like to communicate with people and be aware of that. And sometimes we'll want to amplify a message if there's something interesting going on, but we don't try to control that at all. For more advanced work where there's uh, practical applications going on, it's more important that we coordinate communications, and so we do ask that uh, performers talk to us when they feel like it's a, a milestone or a time to talk about their work. It's not usually, you know, uh, an issue or a difference of opinion. It's just a matter of coordinating and making sure that we're both prepared so that we can answer uh, questions and, and make sure we our, our understandings of what just happened are uh, the same. And if not, why, why are they different? So uh, we just like to be in touch with people and find out, you know, what you'd like to talk about. And we try to let our uh, performers know and when we feel like it's a good time to advertise an achievement or talk about something or respond or not respond to, to some misinformation that may be out there um, and try to try to use our predictive powers to figure out what the best approach is. I think to your question about what can you do to carry the conversation, um, I think the best thing is to just have a conversation. You know, like you see something, uh, Dark is, I mean, you use this because you guys have a great Twitter feed, it's awesome. And you know, you see a really cool vine that they have of this robot, but like, share it. You know, like continue the conversation. I think that's when it comes to uh, what other people can do. Write stories about these things. Explain why it matters to you. Because if it matters to you, then it's going to, in, in some capacity, then it will probably matter to other people in the same way. So being able to continue to talk about these things, making them matter to you and to other people, I think is a really cool thing. 
So we have time for one last question. You've had your hand up there in the back. Peter Morales with EMAPS. The dimension that hasn't been covered, I think, in the two sessions this morning are, if you go look at the ATNL Science and Technology Plan, they say DOD has 10,000 S&T projects. They say we at ATNL can't understand them all. So the issue is, along with everything that you're saying, is how do you go about making it so that if someone wants needs to know about something, which they obviously can't know about, and that project has got a good explanation, how has that person got a hope of ever navigating his way to that information? Okay. <laughs> um, well, I guess that depends on which project. Now, you're right, 10,000 projects is a lot, and it'd be hard to cover all of that, especially uh, from a new broad perspective. But um, it, I guess it depends on what project that they're interested in, and because I actually think there are some organizations who do a really good job of getting as much stuff out there as they can, because they have a pro like many of the uh, research labs and the organizations have programs where they say, okay, so you've got this thing you're working on, you're going to have to tell people about it. And so we're going to write a press release. And they go, well, we're not ready. And they'll say, okay, just tell them that it exists. So there are many, many, many press releases, things that you can read um, that can discuss all manner of things, biofuels, lasers, robots, um, growing things on the moon, all that stuff. It exists somewhere online. The, the thing is really weeding through it. And I think that there are many different organizations uh, that, that keep to the uh, just the facts man sort of um, approach to it, I'd say like the Army Research Lab, the Navy Research Lab, the Office of Naval Research, the Air Force Research Lab, the Marine Corps War, War Fighting Laboratory, DARPA, uh, they're, they're, they have actually like categories on that where you can go to research for more information. And yes, it has, there's so much information out there and we won't be able to cover all 10,000 projects all at once, uh, but you'll at least be able to get parts of information on some of those things within the organizations that control them for the most part. And I would say on behalf of ATNL, they have the Defense Technology and, um, Information Center, DTIC, where as, as a service, we have to put our information on a particular website and you can search it. It's not, it's not exactly user-friendly, I would say. But they also have this innovation marketplace that you can go to and that'll give you links to other uh, sources of information like the laboratory in Ordex that have their own website that talk about what they are doing specifically. I, I think we, I'm, I apologize, you, you maybe can continue this conversation afterwards, but we've, we've got to let these folks go and we've got to let you all have time to get through the lunch line and get back here with your food so that we can keep the force march going. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mary, for hosting this. Thanks to all of you for participating. Very much appreciate it. And if you could. <laughs>